Hey guys, my name is Tom, and welcome to part 11 of my C-Sharp networking tutorial series. Today we're going to implement some server-side AI that our players can fight against. As usual, you can find links to the code on GitHub and the Discord server in the description, so check those out if you run into problems. This is sort of becoming a routine thing at the start of these videos, but before we jump in we need to address an issue. You may or may not have run into this, but if you change the IP that the client is going to connect to at runtime before pressing the connect button, the UDP side of things won't register that change and will cause the whole thing to instantly disconnect. This is because we're calling the UDP class's constructor in the start method, which binds the UDP socket to the endpoint right when the game starts, so if you've tried allowing players to change the IP by using an input field, you probably would have run into this problem. To fix this, all we need to do is move the initialization of the UDP class to the client class's connect to server method. Although it's not necessary, I'm going to do the same for the TCP class to keep things consistent, which means we can get rid of the start method entirely. With that taken care of, let's open up the server project and create two new scripts, one called enemy and another called enemy spawner. Just a heads up, I won't go super in depth on how the AI itself works since all of the logic happens server side and it honestly has very little to do with networking. Also, this AI isn't the most intelligent thing out there, and in an effort to keep things simple, I've also sacrificed a bit of efficiency here and there. This isn't really meant to be an AI tutorial, just a video about implementing AI in the context of multiplayer, so keep that in mind as you watch this. In the enemy class, we're going to add an int for the max enemies, a dictionary to store our enemies by their ID, an int for the next enemy's ID, and an int for this enemy's ID. Inside the start method, we'll set the ID to next enemy ID, increment next enemy ID, and then add this enemy instance to the dictionary. This should look familiar, as it's the same ID system we used for our projectiles. Below, let's add an enemy state enum. Our enemies will have four different states, idle, patrol, chase, and attack. Back in the enemy class, let's add fields to store the enemy's state, target player, character controller component, shoot origin transform, gravity, Patrol speed, chase speed, health, max health, player detection range, shoot range and accuracy, and idle duration, as well as a bool to tell us whether or not the patrol coroutine is running, and a float for the vertical velocity. In the start method, we'll initialize several of these variables. Then add a fixed update method, inside which we'll need a switch statement to determine which logic to execute based on the enemy's state. Below, create a look for player method and use it to loop through all the clients and calculate the distance from the enemy. If the player is within the detection range, we'll use a raycast to determine whether or not the enemy can actually see the player. If so, we'll check if the patrol coroutine is running. Since we haven't created that, we can't cancel it yet, but this is where we'll do that in the future. We'll also want to put the enemy into the chase state and return true. If we manage to loop through all the players and none of them are in range, return false. Next, create a patrol method and check if the patrol coroutine is running. If it isn't, we'll want to start it, so let's create that now. Inside, we'll want to set our boolean to true, calculate a random direction vector on the horizontal plane, and then face the enemy in that direction. Then we'll wait for the patrol duration, which is a field I forgot to create, so add that at the top of the class. Back in our coroutine, put the enemy into the idle state, wait for the idle duration, change the state back to patrol, and set our boolean back to false. In the look for player method, make sure to cancel the coroutine if a target is found. Now in the fixed update method, when the enemy is idling, we'll call the look for player method. We'll do the same if the enemy is patrolling, but in this case we'll check the return value. If no player was found, we'll call the patrol method. Next, add a move method. Inside, remove the direction's y component, face the enemy in the direction, and then calculate the movement vector. The rest is identical to the player's move method, except that we don't check for a jump input. Now add a shoot method, inside which we'll cast a ray, check if we hit a player, and if the shot was accurate, we'll damage the player. Since enemies will be shooting every time fixed update runs, you'll probably want them to absolutely suck at aiming. We need a take damage method as well, which will also be very similar to the players, although instead of starting a respawn coroutine, we're just going to destroy the enemy. Finally, we need a method to help enemies know whether or not they can still see the target they've acquired. 
Back in the patrol method, we can now call move and pass in the patrol speed. Next, create a chase method inside which we'll check if the enemy can see the target player. If he can and he's within shooting range, we'll change the attack state. Otherwise, we'll simply move the enemy in the player's direction. If the enemy can't see the player anymore, we'll remove the target and revert back to the patrol state. The attack method will be very similar to the chase method, but instead of changing to the attack state when the enemy is in range, we'll shoot the target. In the fixed update method, we still need to call our chase and attack methods depending on the enemy's state. And that's pretty much it for the enemy class, although we'll still need to make it multiplayer compatible. Before we do that, open the network manager class and add a field for the enemy prefab. Below, create an instantiate enemy method which will simply create an enemy. Then in the enemy spawner class, we'll need a frequency field which will determine how often enemies spawn. Create a coroutine which waits for the frequency's number of seconds and spawns a new enemy, assuming we haven't already exceeded the enemy limit. We'll start the coroutine in the start method and after it completes to make sure it keeps repeating. To make sure that players can defend themselves, open up the projectile class and damage any enemies we hit in the explode method. Do the same in the player class's shoot method. With that done, we can start adding the multiplayer element. Open up the packet class and add a spawn enemy, enemy position, and enemy health element to the server packet xenom. In the server send class, we're going to add the corresponding methods, however we're actually going to create two for the spawn enemy packet. This is because when a new enemy spawns, we need to send that information to all players that are currently connected, but when a new player joins, we need to make sure that we inform him about all the already existing enemies. Since we don't want to send the spawn enemy packet again to everyone when a new player joins, we'll need a second method that only sends the spawn info to a specific client. To make sure that both of these variants of the packet contain the same data, I'm going to create a third method which takes in the packet instance, adds the info we want to send, and then returns it. The enemy position packet will also contain the enemy's ID and position, but we'll send this through UDP. In the enemy health packet, we'll include the enemy's ID and health, and we'll send it through TCP. Further up in the projectile position method, we're also going to change it to send the packet through UDP instead. I guess I wasn't really thinking when I made it use TCP, since we can afford to lose some position packets, and therefore there's really no reason not to use UDP. Back in the enemy class's start method, we can now send the spawn enemy packet. At the end of the move method, we'll send the enemy's position. Finally, at the end of the take damage method, we'll send the enemy health packet. To ensure that new players are informed about already existing enemies, open up the client class. In the send into game method, we'll send a spawn enemy packet to the new player for every enemy in the dictionary. In the Unity project, duplicate the player prefab, rename it, open it up, and replace the player script with the enemy script. Assign the shoot origin and controller fields, and I'm also going to double the enemy's gravity to match that of the player. Then create an empty game object and attach the enemy spawner script. You can duplicate this as many times as you like, and place them anywhere in the scene. Finally, assign the enemy prefab to the network manager's appropriate slot and hit play. You should see enemies spawning and moving around. Before we move on though, I'm going to move the enemy spawners into the air a bit to make sure the enemies don't spawn halfway in the ground. The server side of things is pretty much taken care of now, so let's move on to the client side. Create a new enemy manager script and open it up. We'll need fields for the enemy's ID, health, and max health. Add an initialize method which assigns the ID and health fields. Then create a set health method which sets the enemy's health and then checks if the health is zero or less. If it is, we know the enemy has died and we can remove it from the scene. In the game manager class, create a new dictionary to keep track of all existing enemies. Create an enemy prefab field as well as a spawn enemy method to instantiate it. Back in the enemy manager class, we need to make sure to remove the enemy from the dictionary when we remove it from the scene. 
In the packet class, we'll add the same three elements to the server packets enum that we added on the server side. Now open up the client handle class and create a spawn enemy method and read out the enemy ID and position. Then call the game manager spawn enemy method. Duplicate this method and rename it, and then instead of calling the spawn enemy method, we'll set the enemy's position. We also need an enemy health method to handle that packet, inside which we'll read out the enemy's health and then apply it. In the enemy position method, we're going to make a modification. Before setting the position, we're going to check if the enemy's dictionary actually contains the enemy we're looking for by using the tryGetValue method. Since UDP is faster than TCP, sometimes the position packets can arrive before the spawn packet, which causes errors because we attempt to access a non-existent element of the dictionary. It's less common when just testing on localhost, which is probably why I haven't run into it myself when making these videos, but quite a few people have asked about this on Discord. This check will prevent any of those key not found exceptions, so we're going to do the same thing in the projectile position, player rotation, and player position handler methods. Finally, we need to add the packet IDs and their corresponding handler methods to the packet handlers dictionary. In the client project, duplicate the player prefab, rename it, and open it up. I added a material for enemies in between videos, which I'm going to stick on the enemy capsule. We also need to assign the game manager's enemy prefab field. Before we test this, open the server project, add an enemy tag, and add it to the enemy prefab which I forgot to do earlier. If we connect to the server now, you'll see that enemies will spawn, move around, and when you get too close they'll attack you. You should also be able to shoot them, and if you break the line of sight they'll stop hunting you down. Be careful though, because if they manage to get you, you might end up in a respawn loop where they shoot you before you have a chance to defend yourself. It might be a good idea to reduce their accuracy even further to prevent this. Anyways, that'll be it for this tutorial. If you enjoyed it or found it helpful, make sure to smash the like button and let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, if you want to stay up to date with all the future videos I produce, consider subscribing and smacking the notification bell. With that said, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you again next time.